Hello, hello, last minute surprise live for our gems today. I know this is unusual. It might be our first Monday live ever. Hit subscribe and then hit the bell for notifications so you never miss our sudden surprise lives. You never know when you're gonna finally convince John to come on and talk about a case that we've been talking about in our home for quite some time. And many of you have asked us about this case, case of Lucy Letby and she was sentenced today. For those of you that know about this case, you know, but for those that are new to this case, Lucy Letby was just sent sentenced today in the UK for life in prison without the possibility of parole. This is the, they do not have the death penalty over there. This is the strongest sentence one can receive. I think she's only the third woman to ever receive such a sentence, and she is now the most prolific serial child murderer of all time, of modern times, in Britain. Uh, she did not appear at her sentencing, which many people, uh, much of the media over in the UK, is very upset about. Uh, understandably so. I can't imagine if Lori Vallow Daybell here was allowed to not attend her sentencing, there would be outrage as well, which meant that she missed victim impact statements of the parents who lost their children in the NICU, uh, the neonatal intensive care unit. She was a nurse there and she has now been charged and sentenced with seven murders in the NICU. She was a neonatal nurse and she injected air into the bloodstream of babies, milk into their stomachs, uh, did all sorts of horrific things. Insulin, uh, she, and she attempted many more to kill many more babies and, um, and then in addition to the attempt, she attempted multiple times sometimes until the baby did die. Uh, a lot of people are trying to wrap their heads around this case and we have been doing that from our home as well, the two of us. And we decided today with her sentencing that it was time to talk about who Lucy Letby is and to take the mask off of Lucy Letby. Again, many people warned the hospital about her Infants were, were dying. There were concerns that she was always um, on shift when this happened. Doctors warned the hospital about her and nobody believed it. People even made certain doctors apologize to her for accusing her of this horrific crime. She was able to commit these crimes for years. So we, we want to talk about her and why people could not see beyond this mask and, and what's been so difficult for all of us to even comprehend. John and I have a personal interest in this case as well. We had our baby boy in the neonatal intensive care unit, completely vulnerable to nurses. We love them so much. We took our son back to the neonatal intensive care unit on his first birthday to thank the nurses there for taking care of our little boy. So we cannot fathom what these parents have gone through. I want to start by sharing an experience from one parent, baby E, if that's okay. During her trial, Lucy Letby's trial, the jury heard how Letby had won the trust of the families she targeted. The mom of baby E recalled leaving her son with her, adding, I trusted her completely. The woman had found her five-day-old child in extreme distress, but was reassured enough to walk away and return to the postnatal ward. Giving evidence at Manchester Crown Court, the mother said, I could hear my son crying, and it was nothing like I'd heard before. It was more a scream than a cry, a sound that shouldn't come from a tiny baby. It was horrendous. I walked over to the incubator to see blood coming out of his mouth. I was panicking because I felt like there was something wrong. Letby, who was in sole charge of baby E, remained at the workstation to the side of his incubator as the mother tried to calm him and persuade her to go back to the postnatal ward. She told her, trust me, I'm a nurse. Asked by Nick Johnson, Casey prosecuting why she did as Letby had told her, the mom replied, because she was in authority and she knew better than me. I trusted her completely. 
The rules were go back upstairs. And if there's a problem, I'll call you. That was Lucy Leppy. I followed the rules. Mr. Johnson KC said that the baby's mom had interrupted Letby as she was attacking the child. She did not realize it at the time. And after murdering the newborn, Letby had then asked the mother whether she would like to bathe him. Letby, who was in sole charge of baby E, remained at a workstation to the side of his incubator as the mother tried to calm him and persuade her to go back to the postnatal ward. She told her, trust me, I'm a nurse. Asked by Nick Johnson. Oh, and I already read that. After murdering the new baron, again, she asked the mother whether she'd like to bathe him. And after the mother said, I was just too broken, I couldn't, Lucy Letby bathed the murdered newborn in front of the mother. Yeah, I, I think... That testimony and that story is a good place to jump into this case because it, it it reveals so much about what's going on. First of all, the the thing that really struck me when you you read that to me initially was the screaming. So you and I both had a child in the NICU, and I think you and I both had to start making distinctions between pain, which would be more screaming and crying, which would be more related to, say, hunger, right? And so it's interesting here, this child has blood coming out of its mouth. This child is, is the parent recognizes that this is unusual. This is screaming. This is pain. This is a child that is about to be killed, right? And, and the parent knows that, senses that, intuits it. And you have the nurse essentially saying, don't worry about it, even though the parent knows Everything is wrong with this situation. The nurse says, don't worry about it. Trust me, just leave, right? And so there's a couple components of that story, I think, that really start making sense of Lucy Letby. The first is that this issue of trust, that when we put a child in the NICU or when we put a, a parent, for example, recently my mother, who's elderly now, was in the hospital, we just anticipate that there's a fundamental level of trust going on and that people will care for people that they're that are entrusted to their care. And so you you have with Lucy Letby you have a real fundamental violation of that social contract of trust that in many ways our society is built upon that social contract that there's certain agreements we all have that if we don't honor them just because we don't feel like it we're really kind of undermining the social contract, which is based on trust. So, you know, when I when I heard that story, I thought of Ted Bundy. And, and the reason I thought of Ted Bundy, who's obviously the notor one of the most notorious serial killers of all time, is because Ted Bundy would lure his victims in oftentimes by wearing a, a cast that wasn't real, right? That he was... Ted Bundy was playing on this social contract, this need for this fundamental need for people to feel that the world is trustworthy and safe. And he would wear this cast and say, I'm hurt. Can you help me? And then his victims would come with them and he would murder them. And Ted Bundy was never hurt. The cast was just a prop. And I, I think here you have in this particular case, at least, and probably in many others with parents that, Lucy Letby is getting to trust her. She's violating, obviously, that fundamental trust. So that, that's part of it, is that she's developed this trust in this unit with nurses, doctors, colleagues, parents, everyone. And she's using that trust against these people. She's, she's violating that trust to really take advantage of the situation and get her needs met. And so, so I, I think typically the, the people that, that take advantage of that trust or abuse that type of trust, they tend to be a little antisocial. I don't know how far I want to go with that, but I, you know, I mean, we could take that all the way to psychopathic. I, I'm sure there's people that are out there that have probably diagnosed her or considered her to be a psychopath. And certainly when you're capable of murdering so many children, I mean, we're not talking, I mean, it's just, it's unthinkable, right? And so what kind of a human being is capable of that? So so I think this issue of trust speaks to this, potentially this deeper issue of someone who's who's deeply antisocial. And, 
And you wouldn't gather that from looking at her life and from looking no. at her, her, her relationships. Right. And so, so that's a part of this story, I think, is that you're not, what you see here is not what you're getting, that there's a lot more going on below the surface. And so this, this violation of trust, this, this willingness to have a mother see her child bleeding. And we're talking about like probably what a month, one month old, two month old child, like the most vulnerable child you could ever imagine is bleeding from their mouth. The mother knows something's amiss. And yet Lucy Letby not only dismisses the mother's concerns, but goes on to murder the child. I mean, I, that's just unreal. That is so antisocial. I can't even wrap my, my mind around it. Whether and then, and then when the mother is too heartbroken to bathe her child, Lucy bathes the deceased murdered baby for the mother in front of her. Right. So, the last act of seeing her baby. She bathes the baby. That to me, yeah, speaking of antisocial. Well, she, right. She's, she's taking on or attempting to take on kind of this maternal function. But at that point, the child is already been dehumanized. She's already murdered the child. I mean, it's just, so that whole scenario is just chilling. And not only that, but the screaming part. So that as a parent who's had a child in the NICU who, NICU who screamed, I can't, like, I can't even describe it. Like when our child, when they, so when they were switching out his feeding tubes, our child was in pain. He was screaming really loud and for a parent it's 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 indescribable it's blood curdling right and and there's nothing more difficult at least for me than to hear my child or any child scream and be in pain and like i think for for most normal people it's sort of a human instinct to help that child or to offer right to offer assurance or comfort or security to that child and here you have a nurse whose job it is exactly to do that, who's doing the complete opposite. So again, there's something deeply antisocial about that as well. And I, I would go even further here and say that inflicting that kind of harm and listening to those screams and still carrying through with that act is extremely sadistic. So you have, you have these elements from the story about violating a fundamental trust, and kind of getting potentially getting the statistic pleasure from harming this child or all these children. So both of those are deeply antisocial acts. And uh, again, I don't, I don't know her well enough. You know, I'm not the, I'm not the psychologist that would have assessed her. So I don't know what people's diagnoses are. I'm going to stay away from that, but I'm just going to observe her behavior here and say that, that those particular behaviors are off the charts, antisocial. They show a lack of compassion, a lack of empathy, right? They show a lack of emotion. Manipulation. Um, manipulation, right? And so all of those types of behaviors are, are very antisocial. I guess if we went to an extreme with it, we'd say that they're psychopathic. Uh, I don't know if they are, but it, you could, I think you could definitely move in that direction with looking at that type of behavior. It's, it's so outside the realm of any normal human response to that predicament that you, it's even, it's just, I mean, I, you know, I, I understand, completely understand why people all over the world are just absolutely incensed by this case because it's such an outlier. Like even for serial killers, this is an this is an outlier beyond what's imaginable. She was in her 20s when this took place. She is 33 years old now. But these crimes happened in 2015, 2016 that are known that the crimes she is charged with. She was busted. CC asked earlier, she just, just started following this how when uh investigators, police decided an investigation was needed into the multiple deaths in one hospital, the high mortality rate of the neonatal intensive care unit. And as one detective said, he never imagined that the police would actually even uncover something so sinister. 
they were not expecting that. They thought this might be something related to medical issues or staffing or better or medical care. Medical equipment, right? It could medical be maybe there's equipment. something with the, right? Uh, who knows? Nobody. But, yeah. So despite her being on shift every time an infant like this died, uh, when doctors brought up concerns in the end, there's one doctor that expressed in, in an article today that he was forced or he was told he needed to apologize to Lucy Letby for even considering that she might be an issue. She does not come across If you see her, I, I would personally describe her looks as something of a nurse. She looks like the girl next door to me. These are opinions of mine. She looks sweet. Um, pictures of her bedroom have appeared online, uh, where she has a dream as a wish your heart makes, uh, you know, sparkle like a diamond. I would call them really kind of cheesy, um, childlike quotes on her wall. Something you might see in a child's room. A dream is a wish your heart makes. That's from Cinderella. I had that song memorized when I was seven. Um, I don't sing it now. <laughs> I've grown up. Um, it's still pretty, but uh, it's not something I'd ever hang in my room. She had a butterfly comforter. You know, so so there's one friend, Dawn. That's what I want to say. One of her childhood friends, Dawn, said, I will not believe she did this until she confesses to me personally. Because there's just the the, the Lucy let be I know growing up is the kindest person. Think of the kindest person you would know in high school. And that's her. She was an only child. Her parents supported her all through this trial. They were there every day, even except until today, the sentencing and the verdict, they've decided to stand by their daughter and not appear, uh, showing their solidarity with her. So I'm just trying to give a little bit of a background of, of what we know about her. When they searched her house, they found two books, I think that are both important, but one is, I just forgot, something greener. It's, it's about a woman wanting to have an affair with a married man. We're going to get to that, put a pin in that. And little notes on post-it notes, post-it note notes that the prosecution uh, has brought up as a confession. They say it's a confession. The defense says, no, these were just journal entries of self-loathing and self-hatred. The prosecution says that they're her confession. Do you want me, do you want me to read those, John, or do you want, where do you want to go from here? Yeah, I think you could, you could read some of them. I think when somebody says in a note, I mean, she doesn't, when somebody says in a note, I, I did it, you know, it's, it's, it seems like a confession. Of course, I don't think she said specifically what she did. So I guess there's a little bit of ambiguity, but yeah, why don't you read a, a bit of the notes or some of the notes? Let me read a few of the notes here. Because the notes are important in explaining who she is. And then I'll, I'll share a picture of one as well. Um, I am evil. I did this. That, that was the main one they brought up, the prosecution brought up. I am evil. I did this. Other words she wrote. There are no words. I am an awful person. I pay every day for that. I can't breathe. I can't focus. Kill myself right now overwhelming fear and panic. I will never have children or marry. I will never know what it's like to have a family. No hope. The post-it notes also displayed confusion about her responsibility for the murders. She scribbled, I haven't done anything wrong. Police investigation, forget slander, discrimination, victimization, all getting too much, everything taking over my life. Hate myself so much for what this has. I feel very alone and very scared. What does the future hold? How can I get through it? How will things ever be like they used? And then in capitals, hate, panic, fear, lost. I don't deserve to live. I did this. Why me? I killed them on purpose because I am not good enough for them. And I am a horrible, evil person. I do not deserve mom or dad. The world is better off without me. There you go. Right. So <clears throat> I think this, this gets into one of the other major elements of her psychological portrait, which would be depression of some sort. I don't, I don't know if her depression 
presumably it's fairly severe, but she is able to function at work. She is able to, you know, attend work regularly. So uh, um, her depression doesn't seem to be so crippling that she can't function in her normal life. So, but, but I mean, a big component of depression is this type of self-hatred, this type of low self-worth. And obviously she's, she's got a lot of that based on these notes. This is someone who clearly doesn't like herself very much. Um, she has the word, you can see the word hate there circled and in black and kind of standing out in a note that isn't in itself very, very negative and an example of the type of self-hatred she has. But it, it does seem like there is this, certainly seems like there's this element of depression here, this element of self-hatred. I think the, the fact that she's putting hate, she's really kind of emphasizing that. I think that's really fascinating in the sense that I think this this potentially is someone who is taking that self-hatred and displacing it or projecting it onto these innocent kids. That she's taking those parts of herself that she really despises and hates. She has, she seems to have this envy of other people with, with children, with yes. small children. So there seems to be this envy of the families probably she's working with every day in the NICU and, and that type of environment. She's, she mentioned that she's panicked about not having kids herself or having a family or finding love. And so I think you, you probably have this combination of self-hatred and envy and she doesn't, she's not healthy enough to really process that hatred. And so she's acting out, she's acting out that inability to express kind of all those feelings of hatred and self-hatred and she seemingly projecting that onto the, these poor innocent kids that she's murdering. And which is, you know, for which even that is, is so out of the ordinary, you know, it's one thing to have these types of feelings and maybe to vent to a friend about how you feel or your family or whatever, but to actually act it out, to actually commit the murders, that's, that's a whole different scenario. You know, I think many people in this predicament might find a therapist or they would find someone to talk to about their depression or their feelings, but she, but she doesn't, she just hangs up quotes in her room that says sparkle yeah. like a diamond, <laughs> shine right. bright like a diamond. Thank she you, doesn't Rihanna. Right. She yeah. doesn't Cinderella seem motivated. Quotes. Yes. Cinderella quotes, quotes, Rihanna quotes. Um, right. What do you make those Go ahead. As if those fantasies are going to somehow transport her to some fairyland or some false reality, right? But um, speaking of fairies, she had fairy lights uh, on okay. the metal frame of her bed. Yes. So fairies, fantasies, dreams. Um, you know, she and you point out the self hatred. She literally said that I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough for them. I am a horrible, evil person. So I think you nailed that with she's putting her hate onto them. Uh, I also thought it was interesting, though, that she said, I will never get married or have children of my own. Um, you know, no hope. And again, she has the Cinderella quote on her bedroom wall so saying a dream is a wish your heart makes. This is right before, you know, Prince Charming rescues Cinderella. She has a Cinderella quote on her wall and then she says i'll never have children or a family of my own so I, and it's so I, there's another component to this that's important and that is that it's not just the depression and the self-hatred let's say you have depression and then one manifestation of depression or one of the symptoms or maybe causes of depression would be the self-hatred that she's showing but there's there's also another interesting element to this in terms of the question, so the question I just raised is why would someone like this act out in this manner, right? Why would they act out in such a violent manner? And and it, it seems like part of the answer to that question is that she was apparently smitten with this doctor at the hospital who was also a pediatrician and a married pediatrician. A media, right. And and so it seems as if, based on some of the evidence that she was trying to get his attention, she may have even wanted to 
potentially harm these children to a point where he would step in and assist her, right? So she had this whole fantasy about this relationship. She did appear to have this relationship. She denies it, but they spent a lot of time together. They wrote texts to each other. They wrote to each other a lot. They communicate. So it does, they, there was clearly some type of relationship. And, you know, as I told you earlier, um, there, to me, this is kind of a version of Munchausen's by proxy, um, which that I don't, which I don't even know. And so let me, the <clears throat> Munchausen's is the old term. The new term is factitious disorder imposed upon another. Let me just clarify that. Cause I know mental health professionals will say, Hey, jo hey Dr. John, you got that wrong. It's, there is no Munchausen's anymore. That's true. But Munchausen's is such a cool term. I, I like, I love that term Munchausen. So, but, um, it has literary ramifications. So, but there is this element of, I think, tech, well, technically she's not the parent or she's not entrusted with the long-term care of these little ones in the NICU. She is, in, in some sense, a temporary guardian, right? She's responsible for their well-being when they're in there and it's her job to oversee their health and well-being. And so I think you 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 could very much argue that you have some versions of some version of factitious disorder imposed upon another here in the sense that she is seeking attention from someone she's yes. she is injuring these children for the purpose of potentially a relationship or to get the 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 attention of a doctor right and so so there is there isn't just this depression but there's this relational component to the depression that she, the depression is a big part of this in the sense that I think that someone without that type of depression would be much less likely to act out in this manner. But when she decides to act out like this, there does appear to be a reason. She wants this relationship. She's has, as you pointed out from her note, she has this fantasy about, you know, love being a panacea, which by the way, has similarities to like Lori, Valo I'm, seeing, I'm seeing Lori here. This this unearthly love, a love like nothing she has ever experienced on earth. She explains it. Lori does. And right. And Lori also same thing. We, we speculated that Lori engaged in factitious disorder imposed upon another as well. Right. Correct. So and and that Lori probably has some version, some I don't know to what depth, but Lori has some depression as well. So I think you're seeing kind of the the these similar elements here playing out and um, you know, so potentially I could argue that without this love interest or this doctor in the picture, maybe it just stays as significant depression. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, maybe she finds another way to act it out. I, you know, but, um, acting out in the way she did is again, it's such an outlier and it's so extreme and unimaginable that it's, it's just hard to to put together, even if you're interested in a relationship with a pediatrician who could potentially intervene in these cases, like to go to the lengths that she did again, like just unthinkable. So in other words, she liked this doctor. She liked attention from this married pediatrician. Thus, when one of the infants under her care died, she was able to reach out to him. And he gave her comfort just as if she was the mother of the baby. Cause here they are in this hospital together. She is caring. She's childless, but caring for this baby. So when something happens to this baby, when the baby under her care gets sick, woe is me. I need attention from the doctor. I need this, this love. And so she's getting that from the doctor through these text messages. And he comes down to visit her comes down to visit her. He gives her attention. He comforts her, praises her. She's, it, it is very similar to, to. But I, I think it goes, it goes beyond that too. That's part of it, but it goes beyond that in the sense that she's asking him for help and she's saying, how could I, what, well, what can we do here to help these kids? Right. She's, she's furthering his involvement when these when these murders are occurring, I mean, you know, obviously he didn't know that at the right. time, but when these children are dying, I think she's able to to use that 
to extend the relationship with him and to try to deepen it in the sense that she's looking at him as an ally. She's looking at him as someone who can help diagnose and someone who can provide not just emotional comfort, but intellectual support, that there's a bit of a mystery here, right? And he wants to bring him in on the mystery and he wants to, she wants to bring him along for the ride in solving this mystery. And therefore she's drawing out the relationship. So it's it's that combination. I think, yes, she's looking for his emotional support, but she's also kind of looking for some way to extend or, or deepen that relationship. And this, you know, he's a pediatrician. I'm, you know, he works at the hospital. Of course he's going to have an interest in all these mysterious child deaths. And she, she has to know that. She also tried to get attention from the parents. When, when the babies died, she created a memory box for one of the families where she put the locks of the hair of the baby and footprints and handprints and sympathy cards. She wrote sympathy cards to parents. So she was also, I want to ask you about that. In addition to what it seems like she's trying to get attention from the parents in doing that, they have her online information where she was looking up grieving parents, the parents of the newborn she killed, she would quickly find them on Facebook and she would go and visit their Facebook pages a lot and see what they're up to. And, and it seems watch them grieve, watch their heartbreak. Right. I mean, again, I think you have you have a Munchausen's component here, potentially, where she's trying to get sympathy from the parents or trying to be seen as the, the caregiver who gave her all to save the kids. Obviously, she didn't. But that's the perception she's trying to create. And also you, you have a little bit of the Rex Heuerman situation here where, you know, Rex Heuerman calls with one of his victims. He gets a burner phone out and he calls the 15 year old sister of one of the victims and he taunts her, right? You have, you, so you, this, this goes back to that sadistic component that in some ways she's, she's trolling the parents of these deceased children. She's, she is, Right. She's there's yeah. some, she's she's playing on their grief and she's there's some element getting back to that sadistic component about the child screaming. I think you have something similar that, you know, Rex Hewerman calling the sister and taunting her about her sister's death. Or at least that, you know, the fact that her sister is missing, I think it, it's something similar to that. I think she's she's kind of reveling in their pain to some degree. So you have, you have a little bit of that sadistic component going on, I think with the memory box and, you know, it's, it's odd, right? Cause she's trying to maintain a connection with these parents to get sympathy. And th yet she knows she murdered them. Right. So Bathing the murdered baby, making a memory box for another. Yeah, murdered so baby. She's, there's a sadistic element where she's saying, you know, I, I did this, I'm creating this pain and now I want to see it. Now I want to, you know, now I want to walk, now I want to kind of bathe in this pain that you're experiencing. So there's, there is this really sadistic component to that too. And that goes back to the screaming, you know, the, the child, like I, it's unimaginable to, I, I would hope it's unimaginable, unimaginable to most of us to hear a child screaming and not to want to lend some comfort or support or aid to that child. And here you have a nurse of all things who's doing the complete opposite. This is like for any parent like us with the child in the NICU or any parent with a child in the hospital, this is like our worst nightmare. Well, we have somebody here whose baby 30 years ago was born in the very same hospital where Lucy Letby was employed. She says, my son was born at the Countess of Chester. Although 30 years ago, I can't imagine the pain and distress the families are going through. You know, I just think yeah. it's so hard for so many of us to even fathom. Um, Sleuthing Sandals is saying she tried to kill four over a two-week period, succeeded with three. There was such a concentration of activity, for want of a better word, with the deaths. I, I was just going to bring this up, too, and I, I know we need to conclude, babe. But, you know, yeah. one, it was she went on vacation, had fun. She went to a hen party, and then she came back. And then, and then just hours after she came back from that party with friends, that's where the concentration would happen or at least one of them where 
any thoughts of that or what might be have been going well, I, through? I think when she was away, she was probably thinking about it. She was probably fantasizing about killing again. So I, I think she felt some, she felt somewhat, she felt a little bit of an urge to an impulse to, to kill again. I, I think that when she, you know, I know this is going to sound bad, but when she was gone, when she was away from the NICU and she had a little bit of a break, I think she missed it. And so she was, there were probably some fantasies about getting back and doing her thing and, you know, and, and murdering again. And that, you know, that's not atypical for serial killers. And she is by definition, a serial killer. So. Someone just asked for a photo of her. There she is. I mean, she's not anyone I would distrust from first impressions. I've never talked to her, but. Well, and not just not just her her looks or her presentation, but her people said that she was so kind and sweet and her attitude, right? Like that, all of that would throw you off. Right. Again, her her friend Dawn, I would have never I I she says she still will not believe it until she confesses to her herself that she will believe she's innocent because they say, think of the kindest girl in high school you knew and i can actually think of one right those just overly sweet girls and that's who she was according to her friend dawn allegedly her dawn is wrong hence the name of this let's unmask who she really is but there she is for those wondering hmm. Yeah, so I think just, you know, to give a quick summary of this case, which is what we're doing here, we're obviously not diving too deep into this at the moment, but to kind of a quick overview, I think those are the main components I would point out. The Some of these antisocial qualities, this depression that has a large component of self-hatred, possibly throwing in, you know, factitious disorder imposed upon another, or Munchausen's, which brings in more of the relational component you know, that, that perhaps she's acting out to get the doctor's attention to, to, to realize that, or to try to bring to fruition this fantasy she has about love and this doctor and where it could go. That seems to be to her some type of panacea uh, for all her depression and her shortcomings and her concerns. And so I, I think it's probably some combination of those, th those elements that I would I would go to at the moment. Thank you, babe. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for helping all of us. You really helped me to process this. It was a heartbreaking one for me. And, and so thank you for sharing your knowledge with everyone. Um, for those that missed our live last night, um, I really recommend uh, watching it and hope that you do for the sake of the victims. It is an underreported horrible crime and the investigation is still ongoing um, so look for, uh, who is Timothy Hazlitt it was last night's live. And I hope all of you will watch it and share it. Thank you for being here for the surprise live, John, love your shirt. Love your shirt. Oh, babe. Thank you. I want to, I just want to end with a quote here. Um, if that's okay, this is, this is a quote by A.A. A. Milne who wrote the Winnie the Pooh series. He happens yeah. to be British. So I think it's totally pertinent to today's show, today's quick show live. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just read a section from Winnie. This is from Winnie the Pooh. Um, Piglet sidled up to Pooh from behind. Pooh, he whispered. Yes, Piglet? Nothing, said Piglet, taking Pooh's paw. I just wanted to be sure of you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, th this quote really struck me as being relevant to this case in the sense that we want to be sure of people, right? Like, I think there's a sense in which you expect a nurse to help your children in the NICU, right? You want to be sure of these types of people. And yet you don't, We, you know, it's the sad part here is you just don't know, right? You don't, people aren't necessarily who they seem to be. And 
I, I think that's the frightening part here is that every, you know, every parent that now has a child in the NICU or in the hospital doesn't even have to be the NICU. You know, do we have to question the people helping our kids or our children? You know, I mean, and these, these, these children, these victims, and that in my heart goes out to all these families, these victims deserved someone they could be sure of. Yes. And that, and that's the tragedy here is, you know, if we're piglet, we want Pooh's paw. And, you know, this nurse is putting the paw out and then taking it away. And it's just, it's just, it's heartbreaking. With that, let's go grab our piglet from school. <laughs> yeah. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, yep. Thank you for those who asked us to cover this case and encourage John to do so. Thank you so much. And um, we'll be bringing you more soon. Thanks, All right. Everyone. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Good afternoon. All right. Good afternoon. Bye-bye.